Um, in 2019, um, I had an amazing opportunity to take a study trip to Israel. If you're a part of our church family, you've heard me talk about this before. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I've had an opportunity to go, and it was a huge blessing for me. And so that was in 2019, to be able to walk in some of the very places where Jesus Christ himself walked just has a way of being so powerful and so profound, and it has rocked my faith ever since. And so when I'm reading the Bible, I often do not read it the same way. I'll be reading a passage, and I just happen to remember being in a certain location and reading that passage, and it all just seems to come back to life again for me. I sometimes go back and kind of thumb through some of those pictures, and it's just an unreal experience that, that I've had, and I'm just so honored to, to be able to do that. And in 2019, one of the places we stopped when we were in Israel was a place called Magdala. Magdala may sound familiar to you because we think of Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was from Magdala. It was the city that she was born in. It's kind of located right there next to the Sea of Galilee. It's about three miles um, from Tiberias. Um, so you kind of get your bearings and kind of see kind of where it is. And uh, again, it was the birthplace of Mary Magdalene. Mary became an ardent follower of Jesus Christ because she had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus radically changed her life, and she never turned back ever. And so um, we, I talk about Mary because we kind of left off a little bit. We, we spoke a little bit about Mary on Good Friday. We kind of went through the narrative of Scripture and the crucifixion and, and then when he was buried. And then today we celebrate the fact that he's alive. And so I bring up Mary again for that reason. Um, and we're going to share a little bit about her story again. We won't park there very long and then we'll continue on. But I have some pictures on Magdala. In the first service, we weren't able to get him up. And so this service, we are. This is kind of a of, of, a, of above, you know, an aerial drone shot of Magdala. And it was only recently discovered um, in 2009. Um, they were going to build a hotel, started doing some digging, and ran into um, some remains. And like, oh my goodness, what did we unearth? And they found a Jewish synagogue right there in the heart of Magdala. Needless to say, the hotel never did build. <laughs> Everything was put on hold, and there is no hotel there today, and there probably never will be. And so they have continued to unearth uh, painstakingly, uh, archaeologists have uncovered Magdala. Um, it's only 10% uncovered, and you can now walk inside an actual Jewish synagogue. Um, this is some pictures that I took from my phone when I was there. Um, you'll see some other amazing things that we don't have time to talk about. Um, and so here's just one more shot of the interior of that synagogue. And what's so profound about this and pretty cool is that we don't have specific reference in Scripture that Jesus taught in a synagogue in Magdala. However, Scripture does tell us in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And so many of those archaeologists believe that it is almost certain that Jesus taught in that very synagogue. Um, and that day was just a beautiful day for me. And it's just one of the highlights of my trips when I was there. And I, again, I bring up Mary Magdalene because it was Mary Magdalene that witnessed most of the events surrounding the crucifixions of Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that it was Mary who was present at the mock trial of Jesus. It was Mary who heard Pontius Pilate's own words as he pronounced the death sentence upon Jesus. It was Mary who saw Jesus beaten and humiliated by the crowd. It was Mary who stood near Jesus during the crucifixion in order to try and comfort him in whatever way she could. It was Mary Magdalene who was one of the earliest eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For some reason, God allowed a woman, this woman Mary Magdalene, to be the first eyewitness of the risen Jesus. That's pretty awesome to think about. And then he commissioned her, Jesus' own words, he commissioned her, you now go and tell everybody else that I am alive. Because of her first words that happened on that day, you're here today celebrating in 2024 that Jesus is alive. That's pretty crazy to think about, um, and I hope you agree with me. Um, here's... Um, Here's that written testimony of, of how I just kind of shared it with you. Here's how it tells us in Scripture. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken, away my, Lord. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have placed him. 
At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary, Mary Magdalene, one more back. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. And because of her faithful te- eyewitness testimony, we today again are here. But yet, did you believe that there are still many people today who think this is all a fabricated feel-good story and that Christians somehow kind of lean on this, we're weak and we're lean on this for hope? Well, one thing is certain, I do lean on the resurrection for hope, but I also would disagree and say it's not a fabricated story. If you study the evidence for yourself, you will be blown away with your own discoveries from Scripture and from other historical accounts. We'll look at a few of those a little bit later that those accounts have transpired over 2,000 years prior. Um, If you go walk in some of these same locations where Jesus walked, if you ever get that opportunity one day, it will also rock your world, and you will begin to have a different understanding, I think, as Scripture comes to life. I don't know if you know this, but this is kind of how I understand that. I don't know if you, that every single atheist or agnostic acknowledges Jesus Christ by the date that's on their cell phone. The date that they write on their checks or documents, 2024. Um, It was 2024 years from Jesus Christ's birth. B.C., before Christ, A.D. is a Latin word, Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. Now, I know there's been some quite a bit of pushback on those. You probably know this. And so there's been a lot of people over the years who've wanted to change A.D. and B.C. because they don't want it to be referenced with Jesus. And so what they say is, let's make it before the common era, B.C.E., or let's just make it B.C., or let's just make it C.E., I'm sorry, common era, because we don't want to offend any other cultures or religions that may not see Jesus as Lord. The irony of this, of course, is that what distinguishes B.C.E., from CE is still 100% the life and times of Jesus Christ. There's no way to explain it. You can give it whatever label you want, but it was Jesus who reset the calendar for us. So how how did this man, Jesus Christ, who we're talking about today, reset this calendar, and every time you write a date, you're acknowledging the fact? How does a carpenter born in a tiny little town called Bethlehem, raised in an insignificant city called Nazareth, in fact, Scripture says, what good comes out of Nazareth? In other words, who's ever been there, right? That tiny little place. Um, How does that person born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, reset the calendar and change the world? A carpenter born in a tiny, obscure corner of the world, how does he reset time It's because he rose from the dead. That's how he resets time. Jesus died in the most horrific way possible. Our Good Friday service, we walked through every single detail of that account that's recorded for us in in Scripture. And if, if, if you were in Jesus' day, you would know a few things. The Romans were ruthless people. The Romans were expert executioners. They knew how to end someone's life, and they bragged about it. And so um, the way that they would do this is they basically would crucify someone. There were many other ways that they would do this, but they would crucify someone just like they did Jesus on the side of a road so that everybody who's walking by would see just how cruel Rome is, and they would take note, better not mess with Caesar, better not mess with Rome, or that could be you. And so Jesus, after his death for everyone to witness, then he was buried, and we, we read that Friday as well, and then... Um, He was dead, buried in a tomb, but the difference between today, and this is why we celebrate, is because he rose again from the dead three days later. When you do something like that, everybody will begin to talk about it. Word gets out, so much so that, again, 2,000 years later, you're all gathering today on Easter Sunday, remembering what Jesus has done. 
Every Christian in the world, from North America to China, Japan to Port Ritchie, Florida, right? We are celebrating, billions of people are celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. And so we worship him, we raise our hands, we sing at the top of our lungs because of this truth. Why? Because Jesus defeated death. He arrested death and defeated sin. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the resurrection. Surprise, you probably knew that, because what else would we be talking about today except the resurrection, right? And so this should not be a surprise to you. And outside of your salvation, which includes the resurrection, there is nothing more important than what we discussed today, your, the fact that Jesus is alive. There's nothing more important. And so today I want to talk to you about a few things. We're going to answer a few questions. Uh, we're going to really answer one question, but have a, some subpoints. And it's why the resurrection matters. Why does the resurrection matter? There's a passage in Scripture that we're going to be um, looking at, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 through 19. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to... Um, Follow me, turn them on, do whatever, make sure I'm not making this up, but it's on the screen as well. And so why the resurrection matters, let's begin with um, these few verses. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Scripture says the Apostle Paul is kind of writing this letter to a church called Corinth, and he's he's, he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus, and he says, if the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, then we are completely and totally wasting our time. That's in essence what Paul is saying here. What we could say is if the resurrection didn't happen, then you might as well leave now and go enjoy, I guess, an Easter dinner with your family because this is all pointless. He says, our lives and our purpose is futility if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead. It's useless if there's no resurrection, then you and I have no hope, period. So why the resurrection matters? Number one, because it happened. That's why it matters. And so it matters, and you need to pay attention because it's actually a literal thing that took place in the history of our world, and so it happened. In our passage today, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives us what many believe is the most extensive treatment of the resurrection of Jesus in all of Scripture. That's a pretty bold claim, but many theologians believe that. Later on, sometime today, you can kind of read the rest of that passage. We're only going to touch the surface of some of these. But again, they believe it's the most extensive treatment of the resurrection of Jesus. And so it makes very good sense for us today to kind of study um, parts of it. The resurrection is the cornerstone of the gospel. It's the cornerstone of the good news which is that Jesus Christ came, he died, right? He died a horrible death on the cross for you and for your sins. He was buried and then he raised again. He was raised to life three days later. And that's good news. And this good news, the fact that the resurrection is true, is a reality that it happened, has been the target of Satan's greatest attacks against the church. I wish I could tell you some of the things that happened behind the scenes today because I believe the enemy doesn't want you to hear the good news that Jesus is alive. Some of us today, we're celebrating that fact. It's a celebration. Some of you today, this is an invitation. Maybe you're still wrestling with this fact that Jesus can indeed change your life. Then this might be an invitation for you today. But if the resurrection of Jesus is eliminated, then the life-giving power of the gospel is eliminated. Then the deity of Christ is eliminated. Then Jesus can't be who he says he is. Then salvation from sin is eliminated. And the hope of eternal life is eliminated eliminated. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians, I love it, I kind of, I call it Paul's pirate mantra. He says, if none of these things happen, he goes, then you might as well eat, drink, for tomorrow ye die. (laughs) That's really exactly what he says. You can kind of read it for yourself later on in chapter 15. And so he's like, if all this is a fairy tale, then you might as well do whatever you want because nothing matters. But the truth is, is that nothing matters most than the resurrection of Jesus. So let's begin as we kind of go back Here's our point as we kind of go back to the first verse of chapter 15. Some of you who are regulars here, you may recognize this as a passage that we've um, read several weeks ago, um, and and I've told you that if you ever want to know how to explain the gospel and what the gospel is, just remember 1 Corinthians 15. And you go right back to 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul's going to give you the answer on what the gospel, the good news is, and we're going to read it for you right now in these first eight verses. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you 
which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I have passed on to you uh, as of first importance, here's the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried. That means he was dead, dead, right? That, that's why I think Paul inserted that. He wasn't alive, like barely moving. He was dead, dead. So he was buried, um, that he was raised on the third day, also according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Kind of a weird reference. I think one uh, reference, it says untimely born or abnormally born. When Paul makes this statement, he's not talking about his physical birth and that mom had issues during delivery. Um, he's not like it came out sideways or something. Um, that's not what he means by abnormally born. Um, that would hurt, by the way. Um, what, what he's saying is that he's talking about his spiritual birth. He's talking about the moment that he met Jesus. Some call it your second birth, right? Some call it, some Christians like to use the phrasing being born again, right? That when you're born again, it's the moment that you were reborn into a brand new life after you surrendered your life to Christ um, and after you've placed your faith and trust in him and what he did on the cross and the fact that he died and then he raised to, to new life and the resurrection and all that, right? And Paul met Jesus with a radical encounter that he had had with him as he was on his road. They call it the road to Damascus encounter. But Paul met Jesus, here's the, here's the kicker, after, Paul met Jesus after he had already been crucified and died. So how do you meet someone who has already died? They would have, come, have to come back to life in some way. Now, I know Paul's encounter was a unique one, but he indeed met the risen Lord. You can find out there's other passages that kind of say he says it right for himself. And so they would have, in, in order to meet somebody who was dead and now they're alive, meaning they have had to come back to life. And that moment when Paul encountered the risen Jesus, it radically changed his life forever to the point that the Apostle Paul is known as the greatest apologist or defender of our Christian faith. I also went to Rome and then to Greece, and I followed all of the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. Everywhere he went, we followed his footsteps on his journey, and it's unbelievable the strength of this man and all that he did for continuing to move the message of Jesus Christ. But prior to his encounter with Jesus, he was the greatest opponent of the Christian faith. In fact, if you would have heard about Paul and you were a Christian, you better run and hightail it out of there because Paul may come after you. Because anybody who would stand for Jesus, Paul would hunt you down. He was a murderous threat to Christians. He was responsible for overseeing of Christians being personally dragged from their homes and murdered for their faith in Jesus. You can read all of these details in the account of the book of Acts. And in that moment when he met the risen Christ, his life Boom, changed within a second forever. He went from being the greatest opponent of the Christian faith to the greatest proponent of the Christian faith. Literally overnight, Paul changes teams. I'm no longer on that team. I'm now on this team. So Paul was responsible also, a part of his past before he had this encounter with Jesus. He was responsible for encouraging the stoning of the faithful Christian Stephen. You may have heard of Stephen in the book of Acts, chapter 7. You can read of that account. He personally witnessed Stephen take his last breath as they literally stoned Stephen to death for believing in the risen Jesus. And in the next moment, as he's one moment, he's witnessing and encouraging the stoning of Christians to the very next moment, he's He's the greatest witness the world has ever known and has written more New Testament books that you hold in your lap today. And he says, I'm going to give my life for Jesus. I'm going to face threats of my own life, beatings and imprisonments by my very tribe that I once led because I had had an encounter with the risen Jesus. The resurrection matters because it happened. 
In Luke's account of the resurrection of Jesus, he captures some of the pushback that was happening in these early days when the message was beginning to be spread. Um, And so not everyone believed this message, just like not everybody believes the message that we have today. Um, And so Mary Magdalene returns. She begins to share of the fact that what Jesus told her to share, begin to, to spread this news that he's alive and not everybody was believing. And listen to how these verses share with us of that pushback. It's the same verses that started our video out this morning, which, by the way, I love that video. And Luke chapter 24, notice what happens. In their fright... Uh, The women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? The angel said, He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, and then be raised again. Then it clicked, and they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and um, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. And here's the kicker. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like, what's the word? Nonsense. None of them assumed resurrection. Not even Jesus' own disciples thought that Jesus was going to resurrect. He had even told them countless times, I'm going to die, I'm going to rebuild this temple, I'm going to die, I'm going to come back. He he told them this over and over and over. There's even this fun part where Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples and they just don't get it. He's like, why are you so dull? I love that. Um, It gives us hope because I think sometimes we can be dull too. And so Jesus is frustrated, um, I'm sure at times, with his own disciples. And here's one of those cases where they just still don't get it. Nobody is expecting resurrection because when you go to a tomb of a dead person, what do you expect to see? A dead person, right? And they assumed that Jesus would stay dead. And so the testimony of the women and these first eyewitness accounts seemed to them like nonsense to the very way that it seems like nonsense to many people today. I heard a pastor recently share kind of a little illustration that I thought was really crazy, almost stupid. And then it kind of, I sat with it for a bit and I really just kind of thought it was cool. And I said, I'm going to share that. So I just want you to kind of bear with me because it's going to seem a little strange, seem a little weird. But imagine if, as you were pastor, that's me, hopefully you can say I'm a good pastor, good friend, and I love you, and, and let's say that I have figured out the secret for you and I to know how we can literally fly, okay? I know it's weird, it's strange, just kind of bear with me, but I have figured out the secret to how we can fly, and I'm the first person to discover this truth that flying really can happen, and it's, you don't even have to be in an airplane, and so um, I, I began to figure this out, and I, would, and I would begin to kind of share with you one Sunday morning. I'm going to be like, hey, it's going to be a little different today. We're not going to have the traditional sermon because I found out how you can fly, and I want to tell you guys how you can do it too. And what if I encourage you, you just take your right hand, you tap your leg three times, one, two, three, tap once on your left leg, twice on your shoulder, snap three times, and all of a sudden I would begin to levitate off of the stage, and you would all be like, Whoa, we didn't know Pastor Paul was this grand illusionist, this David Blaine or David Copperfield, depending on what era you're from. You know, be like, wow, we didn't know this. And then all of a sudden, I would start to fly and float around the room over your heads, right? Now, I know some of you well meaning people would be like, eh, it's nonsense. Don't believe it. And so immediately you would be looking for what? Wires or cables. And you're like, Pastor Paul's come out of the ceiling before, right? Those who know me. Um, So I know this, this has to be rigged. This has to be something that he's doing. But then what if some of you began to take me seriously? And what if I began to like really tell you, look, guys, there is no cables, there is no wires. You can come up and you can check and you can put a hoop around me, whatever. I'm telling you, it is legit. I figured this out the other night and I just want all of my best friends to know. Now, can you guys try it with me? And then I would just all, you know, take your hand, tap three times, once, twice, snap three times, all of a sudden. What if one of you believed me and said, I'm going to do this? And just one of you began to, one, two, maybe the secret of your, you know, dun, dun, dun. I think I got it right. And all of a sudden, you would start floating too. And would you believe it? Now there's two of us now floating over the crowd, right? And everybody's like, well, they must be like in cahoots or doing something together here. It can't be true. And then some of you would go home and you would be in your closets. You would be like, 
One, two, three. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. Oh, Pastor Paul, you're, you're right. I, I can fly. I can't believe it. How long would it take for the world to find out that you have the secret to flying? Some of you would grab your phones. Okay, normally we're talking about, in our blog, we're talking about how to, you know, be a mechanic and, you know, whatever, put makeup on. But today, we're going to show you how you can fly. Everybody follow me, you know, you follow me three times, one, and everybody's, oh! How long would it take for the watching world to begin flying? In our world today, seconds. Seconds. How fast would it spread? Some of us would be more excited about telling others about how to fly than about telling people how to live forever. Think about that for a moment. As a a Christian, we know if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have the secret to know how you can live forever. You have that secret. And how much How many of us would have more zeal telling people how they could fly than telling people how they could live forever? Well, I'm just, I don't know if I could share that with my coworkers because they might think I'm a Jesus freak. I mean, I'd be at lunch and I'd be telling them that Jesus, you know, loves them. And I just think it would look so weird if I'm telling them on how they could be a follower of Jesus. And so I just don't think I can do it because they may think my words are nonsense. When I tell them I can fly, they're going to think that I am crazy. If you told your your neighbor today, okay, our pastor told us how to fly, just watch. Do it with me. Watch. It's crazy. Your neighbor will say, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back another day, (laughs) right? Your neighbor would think that you are nuts until they try it and until they, too, begin to fly. And then all of a sudden, they're in. They're calling their friends. Mom, you won't believe it. They're calling their neighbors. You won't believe what I've found. I found the secret. They won't think you're crazy anymore. And we have been entrusted with this message of the resurrection of Jesus to share the hope of Jesus like Mary Magdalene first did to those around us. Will others think it's nonsense? Quite possibly, until they try it, until their lives are changed. Until they see your living testimony, how your life has flipped upside down. And when they try it, they'll be like, this this has got to work. I, too, need this hope for my life. In this first century, by the way, and you're probably capturing those details, the early Christians, the early followers of Jesus could have cared less that they looked like nonsense. They could have cared less. Um, The message of the resurrection spread throughout the world because it happened. Notice as we come back to to, uh, chapter uh, 15, verse 3 through 8. I know we read it again, but I want us to look for a few other details here about who it was that that has discovered these things. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. And that he appeared to Cephas. Peter, there's one. That's, That's another name for Peter. And then to the 12, right, there's... There's 13, right? After that, he appeared to more than how many? 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. We learned that when we went through our last study. That means that they're dead, right? Uh, Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me, Paul, right? Also, Paul's the one who's writing this, right? And so today, we believe the resurrection happened because of these many eyewitness accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. People saw it for their own eyes. Do you really think that 500 plus people would make this up? Paul says, most of them are still alive. I love this little detail. So Paul's writing this not so many years after Jesus has now already ascended back to the Father. He's been raised to life. He's ascended back to the Father. Paul's now writing this. How do we know it's within just a few years? Because most of the 500 are what? Still alive. So Paul kind of shares that little detail, and he says, by the way, they're still alive. Go ask them. You don't believe me? Go knock at James's door, right? You don't believe me? Go talk to Jim. You don't, you don't believe me? Go talk to Paul. He, he saw him with his own eyes. You really think that Christians would stand up for their belief in the risen Jesus to be martyred for their faith? 
I have a book called The Fox's Book of Martyrs. Some of you might be familiar with that book. It goes over detailed stories and accounts of faithful followers of Jesus Christ who were murdered horrifically for their faith. History tells us that every single one of the apostles were tortured or went to a martyr's death, and not one of them ever went back on their testimony. Not one of them caved. Why? Because they saw it. Why? Because it happened. The idea of this, some kind of myth, there's so many myths, and you can go back to our YouTube channel and go back a couple of years, and we, we talk about all the myths of the resurrection on Easter Sunday, I think, in 2022, um, and you can kind of follow along. Um, we, we talk about many of those things, but there was all sorts of wild claims out there that this must be some exaggeration, that it just didn't happen. The apostles were martyred for their confession in Jesus Christ in some of, again, the most horrific ways. The resurrection wasn't an add-on to their message. It was the central focus of their message. And Jesus told them, you are my witnesses. You are going to take this message of hope to the nations regardless of how crazy you look because when people begin to believe it, it will change their lives. Now, my guess is that some of us know somebody, maybe it might be yourself, or you're here today, and you are one of those who you just have a lot of doubts you have a lot of questions. You're maybe in the middle of this spiritual journey. Maybe you're not even a believer in Jesus because you have a lot of questions about his resurrection or his death and kind of what this can mean for you. And that's okay as long as you're continuing to search for answers in the midst of your questions. I have some friends that I've known who pride themselves on their doubts. In fact, they research more of adding more doubts to their list than they do researching answers. And it drives me batty, you know. Just, just read the word, right? Just ask God for some clarity. Just, you know, ask, you know, somebody, ask a friend, but don't just look for all the negative. And all they continue to do is look for all the ways that they can add more fodder to the fire that's going to somehow back up uh, their claims that this is all just a fairy tale. Matthew 28, verse 17, shares with us some interesting verse in the New Testament on doubting. Um, Jesus has kind of gathered everyone on the hillside after being with them for 40 days. So he's now been risen back to life. He's been hanging out with them for about 40 days. Um, and he's talked with them. He's surprised them behind locked doors. And we've, we've read those accounts before. And um, he ate with them. He's, he's showing them his hands. Hey, guys, yeah. He's showing them his hands and, and his side and his feet where the nails pierced, right? Remember Thomas is like, yeah, it can't be him. Just, there's got to be wires, right? There's got to be makeup. And remember doubting Thomas and everyone's kind of asking, well, show us some proof. And he gives me some food. The most basic thing that you could do in life, Jesus says, give me a piece of fish. And he eats it in front of them because he wants them to know that I'm eating in front of you. I'm not a ghost, right? And so Jesus is kind of proving all these things. And then then he begins to share with them his great commission, this idea that you're going to go tell everybody else, just like Mary Magdalene did. You're going to have this same message, and you're going to be bold. Some are going to think it's nonsense, but you go and you do it and declare it with boldness because Jesus changes lives. And then he says all of that, and then we come to verse 17. You can imagine that crazy... Uh, kind of the, how it would feel in that time. Everybody's listening to Jesus' words. He's showing them proof about all this. And then he says, when they saw him, they worshiped him. Some worshiped him, but some what? Nah, it can't be him. Right? Come on. They literally saw him with their eyes. Nah, don't believe it. He must be a great illusionist. You see, Easter has the potential to bury our objections and to bury our doubts, and it can all be possible with our belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a verse in Corinthians that says, you will not understand the things of God if you don't know him. It doesn't mean that you're in your devotional time, you're like, I have no idea what I'm reading in Leviticus. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you don't understand that you're a sinner. You don't understand that you need a savior. You don't understand those things because you don't know him. If you, first of all, make the dive and begin to place your faith and trust in him, those other questions and doubts, I believe, will begin to get answered. Not all of them, but enough to give you an understanding of what you need in your life. Because faith happens when the unexplainable, all the unanswered questions, meets the undeniable. The undeniable claim is the fact that Jesus has arose from the dead. If you were certain that Jesus was raised from the dead, wouldn't you reconsider some of your doubts about him? If you were certain that he did that, 
then hopefully some of the other doubts would be like, yeah, he's, if he did that one, I'm not going to question anymore, right? So why the resurrection matters because it happened. Number two, these next two are faster. It confirms Jesus is our Savior. If we were to go back in the beginning of the Bible, go back to Genesis, right? If we were to start in Genesis 1 and begin to kind of read through the creation account, and God's creating these, his, his beautiful creation. It kind of shows us that God is sovereign, that God is in control of all things, right? Um, and so we, we believe that he created those things. And then um, at the pinnacle of his creation, he creates human beings, right? More affectionately known to us as Adam and Eve, right? And so he creates Adam and Eve, right? And then Adam and Eve now are, are walking in the garden. It seems like everything's just great. And then they screw it all up, right? They mess up. They sin royally. They're disobedient to God. And before you're too harsh on them, just know that you would have done it too if you were one of the first human beings. You wouldn't have survived either, right? But God in those moments, he gives us Even though he's sovereign over all of his creation, I can't explain all of those details, he still gives us a heart and a mind to think for ourselves and to give us free will. Even though he's in control, he still gives us a free will to understand those things. And those first human beings that God created messed it all up. We call this the fall. And so you can read this in in the, the, the narrative of scripture in Genesis in the beginning. And so we call it the fall. And that's when sin entered the world And everything began to break down. And so human beings decided to live life on their own terms. I don't need God to tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want to do. These things look good to me, so I'm going to eat these things. I'm not going to listen to God anymore. And so all of that took place in the garden. And the problem is is that sin separates us from a holy God. There's a major problem with that. I want to have a connection with a loving, almighty God the God who created me in the watching world, right? I want to have that connection. But sin separates me from a holy God because God wants nothing to do with your sin. And so God had this idea from the beginning. He knew he's sovereign over all things. His idea was, I'm going to send a savior. I'm going to send a Messiah who's going to come and he's going to take the place of all of these people and all of their sin that they've done He's going to die for the sin of the world so that people may live. And so that when a holy God looks at you, he no longer sees your sin. He now sees Jesus Christ who took your place. And you will now have hope and you can one day live for all eternity. Right? And so we read of all of those things. And that all took place because Jesus arrested and defeated death. And so as as the Bible narrative continues... God begins to tell his people, before the New Testament was ever written, God begins to tell his people of the plan. Guys, don't worry. I got this all under control. I have a plan. His name is Jesus. He's going to come one day, and he's going to put everything back together. And so um, we read of these prophecies. There's a a Jewish um, theologian. He's an uh, Old Testament scholar. His name is Alfred Edersheim. He's just a kind of cool, fascinating little writer. And he believes that there are 456 Old Testament verses that refer to a coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, before Jesus was born. So these prophecies happened in the Old Testament, 456 of them, before Jesus ever was born in Bethlehem, right? Isaiah 53 is one of those grand, probably the most popular of prophecies. People read Isaiah 53, right? And and they, they talk about this suffering servant. They talk about this servant who's going to come. And by his wounds, we will be healed, right? And so Isaiah 53 is one of those popular ones. Um, There's another one in Psalm 1610. I display this one for you because this one's important. And so notice what David says in Psalm 1610. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. The faithful one is a reference to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, before Jesus ever even came on the scene and was born. So here in this prophecy... This verse, Psalm 1610, is one of the very first verses ever preached in the church. This is one of the very first verses ever preached in the church. How do you know it? Because it's referenced for me in Acts, in the early church. And so we'll read that in a second. So Peter, if you remember, Peter is emboldened by the Holy Spirit. He's beginning to do what Jesus has asked him to do, to share the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's doing that. Church has begun, man, when it took off, it took off in some pretty amazing, powerful ways. You can read that in Acts chapter 2. And all of a sudden, a crowd gathers, and people are like, I want to know what the hype is at this church. 
I want to know about this Jesus who's claiming that he rose to life and you guys saw him. Can somebody kind of let us in on the excitement? We want to know. And like that, Peter begins to speak to a crowd of people who've gathered, and he quotes Psalm 16, and this is what he says in Acts 2. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you, I'm in the middle of the sermon, by the way, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David, guy who wrote Psalms, right, or part of the Psalms, died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. David was a great guy, was the king, was awesome, yeah, and, and, and from David we have Jesus, all that we understand, but J- David's dead, right? Um, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants, Jesus Christ. On his throne. He continues, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. There's the resurrection again. Every time you were at church in the early days, it would not be a surprise. The resurrection of Jesus would be what you'd talk about because everybody wanted to know and everybody wanted to continue to talk about it. And you would be talking about it too if you saw it. Um, That he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. He quotes the same verse. First sermon ever preached in the church. The main message, again, being around resurrection. Jesus defeated death. He saves us from our sin. He saves us from the consequences of our sin, which is separation from a holy God. You can experience a hell on earth, which is separation from a holy God here, and you can one day experience an an eternal hell if you don't have a relationship with God. How do you have a relationship with God? Because you need a mediator. (laughs) You need somebody to bridge the gap that can help you have a relationship with a holy God, and it comes through knowing his son, Jesus Christ. So in order for Jesus to save us from this death, from the consequences of our sins, Jesus himself will have to go through death himself. And this is what he does for you, and this is what we remembered on our Good Friday service just two days ago. Think about your story, regardless of of where you are at in your story at at this point in your life. Maybe you're proud of where you're at in your story. Maybe you're not so proud of where you're at. Maybe it's a mix. Regardless of what you have done in your past, regardless of what you've done last summer, regardless of what mistakes, what sins, what addictions, regardless of what you've been doing for the last 20 years of your life, Jesus Christ is in the business of saving people's lives, and he is so, so good at it. And maybe you're here today and you're in need of a Savior. We're all in need of a Savior, but maybe you've never declared him as your Lord and Savior. And so that marks you. That's your label. And maybe today you're like, you know, maybe I need to trust him. And you can trust him. He went to a cross for you, defeated death for you. And because of the resurrection, it confirms to us that he is who he says he is. He is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, some naysayers... um, like to say, well, you know what, Pastor Paul, all you're doing is quoting the Bible to back up the Bible, and I think that's silly. And Well, there's other historians that have also talked about this risen Jesus. There's a guy named Flavius Josephus. I love to say his name. Uh, It's just fun. Um, And he wrote um, in 93 AD, this is a a historical document that he wrote. You can read it for yourself. You can Google uh, Flavius Josephus, and he wrote this in 93 AD. Keep in mind, Josephus is not a follower of Jesus. Not a Christian. Notice what he says. I quote him um, in his writings and history. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, it is to, if it is to be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as, as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles, meaning both Jews and Gentiles believed in him, right? He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Not at this day either, Josephus. We still gather in his name. We still sing songs and praise him. We still celebrate his resurrection. We still still tell stories about him and how he's changed our life and how we've been able to die to certain things within our life. We still tell these stories because it happened, right? And because we've experienced this resurrection life within our own bodies. 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, come back to this. Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Remember we read that? And you are still in your sins. If Jesus is in a grave somewhere in the Middle East, then we are still in our sins. If there is no resurrection, then there is no hope. If there is no resurrection, then our sins still control us. Then the addiction still owns us. Then our past decisions still define us. If there is no resurrection, then we are defined by what we have done. We are greedy, we are idolaters, we are liars, we are cheaters, we are addicts. Whatever other adjectives you want to use that's in your story, that's what defines you if the resurrection didn't happen. Whatever it is that is in your past... This now leads us to hope because the resurrection happened. It confirms that Jesus is our Savior, and lastly, it gives us great hope. I talk with a lot lot of people over the years who've been hurt in some pretty tremendous ways. They kind of share their story, and they share their personal experiences and how somebody has abused them, how somebody has taken advantage of them, and how they maybe have experienced some tragedy within their life. And it's often, that's the marker on their timeline that they can't get past. And it's that tragedy that tends to be a hang-up for why they're not placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And we've all heard it, right? They'll say, if God really loved me, then why would he allow me to to have this tragedy in my life that I can't seem to get by? And so they have all of these questions. But the problem is they're still seeking a dead Jesus. That's the problem. They're seeking a dead Jesus, and they're not placing, they're not diving in and looking for the possible hope that Jesus can give them. And so these people are lost, and there is no hope for them at that point in their life. However, when they begin to understand and place their faith in Jesus, hope begins to rise. And what if God said to us, I'm I'm not going to answer all of your questions right now. I can't tell you why all those tragedies took place within your life because the mental capacity in your little brains can't handle it, right? What if God told you that? And by the way, would it really be helpful if God gave you all of the answers to everything you faced in your life? I don't know if it would be helpful, you know? I gave you that ticket because you were speeding on Sunday morning, I'm not going to let you get by the next time, right? So, I mean, I, I don't think it would really help if all of those major tragedies, God somehow gave us answers. But what if you believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and what if you began to allow that truth to permeate your life from the inside out like it did the Apostle Paul's? And what if you began to say, maybe this is it. Maybe he is who he says he is. Maybe he truly can radically change my life. Then I want to place my faith in him, the risen Jesus. Even all of the early followers, we just read about it, they all had doubts, and they were walking with him. They were listening to him, and they still had doubts, but they eventually allowed the truths of his death and his resurrection to trump the doubts in their life, and they were able to get past the hurts and the tragedies, and they entered new life. Romans 10, 13 says, for all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10.9 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what if you called upon the name of the Lord today? What if you believed? What if you confessed with your mouth, as scripture says, that Jesus is Lord? Even though you might not have all of your questions answered, you at least would believe in something that would prove to you that there is an answer. And Jesus himself says, I'm the answer. I'm the way. And the truth and the life, no one comes to a holy God except through me, through me. If the resurrection is undeniable in your life, then it will begin to change the unexplainable. And this gives us hope. We also receive hope from the resurrection because... We are now no longer stuck in our sins. No, death was arrested. Our sins no longer label us or identify us. All the things in our past, our present, and even in the future to come, those sins no longer identify you. They are no longer the labels that tell you who you are. 
And that's because of the resurrection. When God looks at us, he no longer sees the mess of your sin. He sees Jesus who took your place because Jesus defeated sin and death. 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. One day, much sooner than you realize, you are going to know what matters most. The older I get, the more that I have a different understanding and perspective about life and knowing what really matters in life. And sooner than you know, you too will realize that. And you will discover that it is Jesus, that it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that matters most. His death for the forgiveness of your sins and him showing you that he has defeated death, which, is allow, which allows you to have access to the Holy Spirit, which empowers you to, to die to those old things, to die to that way of living, to die to those addictions, to die to that sin. And he welcomes you to enter into brand new resurrection life that you can experience here on earth and one day when he calls you for all eternity in heaven where there will be no more shame, no more sadness, no more sickness, no more cancer, no more disease, no more migraines, no more death because there will be hope. And Maybe you've heard the gospel before, but some reason today you sense that God's inviting you in in a different way. If we could just close our eyes for a moment and um, just so that we can eliminate distractions and um, I just want you to think about where you are at right now in your life. Maybe today is a celebration for you. And so you're just celebrating the reality that Jesus lives within you. You have access to his Holy Spirit. He's allowing you to kind of defeat these things. And, and you're having an amazing Christian life. Sure, we got our ups and downs, but you celebrate that Jesus is alive today. And for you, it's a celebration. For maybe some of you this morning, like the few in our first service, for you it was an invitation. And you're, you're sitting there today, and you're like, you know, I, I sense that. I don't know what it is, but I just really sense that God's speaking to me. Yeah, God's drawing me to himself, and I need to declare him as Lord and Savior of my life. And I got all these questions. I got all these doubts. But how I'm understanding it is if I can just dive in and just kind of declare him as Lord and Savior and believe that he died for me and rose again three days later, then I want that undeniable to begin to explain the unexplainable. And I want to have that hope in my life. If that's you this morning, I just want to encourage you. If you could, um, no, I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. There's no bait and switch here. I just want to pray for you. But I, but I would like to ask you if you could look up at me and don't look down until I lock eyes with you. And I'm going to start on this side. If that's you this morning and you're like, I, I have that invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Don't look down until I lock eyes with you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thanks. God, you're uh, so good. Um, I, I pray that these um, individuals who looked up this morning, maybe silently where there are, that they would simply cry out to you in their own heart and you might simply say, Jesus, I need you in my life. You might say in your heart, Jesus, uh, I, I'm, I'm believing that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again three days later. And I want to declare with my mouth that you are Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus, will you radically change my life, please? I need hope. <laughs> 